Well, good afternoon, Hart. It's great to be with you today. Thank you. It's good to be here. We are so truly honored to spend some time with you, you know, with you, our friend, our colleague, and Hart, actually, you are something amazing in the NAPIC community. At this year's 55th Annual Advanced Estate Planning Strategies Conference in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 2018, the National Association of Estate Planners and Councils, NAPIC as we affectionately call it, will recognize you, Hart, with the highest honor that we can bestow on one of our members, being named to the NAPIC Estate Planning Hall of Fame as an accredited estate planner distinguished. This award is given annually in recognition to significant and outstanding lifetime achievement and contributions to the practice and profession of estate planning. No one, I repeat, no one is more deserving of this honor than you, our own Hart Axley. In tribute to this lifetime of service and commitment to NAPIC, Mary Kay, Kit McNee, and I, Paul Viren, current board members of NAPIC, want to share some of Hart's story with all of the listeners in this interview. Our vision is to learn of Hart's experiences and journey with NAPIC for these many decades that you've led us through. It will be helpful to know some background for Hart before we ask some questions and learn more in more detail of your journey, Hart. Hart, you served as a captain in the United States Army, as a Judge Advocate General. You earned your Bachelor of Arts from the University of Wisconsin in Madison in 1952, as well as your Juris Doctorate degree from the same school in the School of Law in 1956. It was during this time that you began to focus on estate planning and in 1955 placed first in a wills drafting competition. After passing the bar in 1956, Hart, you joined the law firm of Holland and Hart in Denver, Colorado as an estate planning specialist. And in 1958, you joined the Colorado Agency for the State Mutual Life Insurance Company where you uh, prepared needs analysis for life insurance and other assets in clients' estate planning. In 1962, you earned the Chartered Life Underwriter CLU designation from the American College and gained admission to the Denver Estate Planning Council and you, your first experience in the Estate Planning Council world. In 1964, you began serving as, a as an officer of the Denver Estate Planning Council and moved up through those chairs. In 1968, Hart, you met Fred Rosell, an important person in your life, immediate past president of the, of the National Association of Estate Planning Councils, as it was called at that time, and quickly began your volunteer experience with NAPIC. This year, 2018, marks your 50th anniversary, Hart, as your of your dedication and time with NAPIC. An amazing, an amazing career, and we are so grateful for all you've done for us. You've been instrumental in establishing the Accredited Estate Planner AEP designation in 1982, and this designation has been the leading estate planning designation in our profession. In 1996, Hart became a charter board member of the Estate Law Specialist Board, which is accredited by the American Bar Association and administers the Estate Planning Law Specialist certification the only national legal specialization in the United States. In 2004, you were appointed Lifetime Emeritus Director of NAPIC and currently serves in that capacity and have been so faithful in coming to every board meeting that I've attended in my many years in being a member of the board. Your passion about your nine Colorado State Planning Councils, and you, would, you are so passionate about those councils and attend nearly many, many of their local meetings. We are honored to spend some time with you today, Hart, and to learn more about your amazing life's journey and all you have accomplished in your many years of service to NAPIC. Thank you very much. I hope I can live up to that introduction. I would clarify a couple of things. One is that uh, I started in law and had planned to be in law the rest of my life because my father was a lawyer, a very prominent lawyer in Madison, Wisconsin, and it was in about February of my senior year in law school that my mother came to me and said, uh, 
your dad hasn't figured out how to tell you this, but somebody needs to, you can't practice with him because his law firm had an anti-nepotism provision and they couldn't consider anybody who was a relative. And that's what I call getting a swift kick out of the nest mm. because uh, I didn't want to practice with a competing law firm because that was my law firm in Madison. So I planned to practice law. Well, <clears throat> law school was an interesting experience for me. First of all, Uncle Sam intervened in the middle of it, and so I had spent two years in the Far East, and it was hard to go back to law school and get back into that mm -hmm. studying routine. But that was what I had planned all my life, so that's what I did. However, I had problems. I had problems in the military because I couldn't stay awake. And I had even more problems mm -hmm. in law school because I couldn't stay awake. And I never really read all of what I was supposed to read for any one class because I couldn't stay awake more than five minutes reading and I was asleep. Well, when I got to got through law school and got hired by Howland and Hart to come out here to Colorado, um, the question was, was that the right thing to do? Actually, when I was interviewing, the guy who was the retired probate judge said, you know, Hart, I'd love to have you in my staff at the First National Bank Trust Company as a trust officer. But he said, if you think there's any possibility you would like to practice law, you should do that first. Because going back from trust work into law and having to take the bar exam years after you've been in school will be very difficult. Whereas if you start in law, you can always go into trust work. There's no problem in that direction. I thought that was pretty good advice. So while I got offers to practice law, or practice with the trust world, I didn't take those. Waited to see what was going to happen, and I did get an offer to practice law in a law firm. However, I couldn't stay awake. And as a young attorney in a big firm, most of what I was doing was legal research as to which put me to sleep fastest, the Internal Revenue Code <laughs> or the Labor Relations Reports, because those are my two areas of ex expertise. Mm. The result, a dead heat. Mm. Holland and Hart was the largest law firm in Denver, in Denver maybe still is. Mm. It was not the place for me. Mm. And so I had to look, find somewhere where I could use my law background, but wasn't constantly reading. One of my, the next guy over from my office was a Harvard law grad. And when he found out that I was interested in insurance and I promised him that I wasn't, he said, well, if you ever are, there's a guy by the name of Bernie Rosen, who's an MBA from Harvard. But when I have an insurance situation, I can explain to him the facts and he'll tell me what the problem is and then what the solution is. Well, that coming from a Harvard law grad was pretty impressive. However, I was not convinced I wanted to be in insurance. Turned out that the next day there was a Harvard law alumni, or a Harvard alumni get together, and this guy, Bernie Rosen, was next to Ben Chidlaw, the attorney, and they talked about it, and he said, you ought to talk to Hart. He did. Now, my immediate reaction when he called was, I don't want to talk to you because I'm not interested in insurance. But you don't tell that to somebody who is referred by a close friend. So I agreed to have lunch. Bottom line is that uh, he used a, an interesting approach. He would spend six weeks talking to us every Wednesday night about reasons why I shouldn't go into the practice of mm. insurance. Talking you out of it. That's right. Mm. Well, every one of those sessions, I would be there and in five minutes I would be asleep. And Bernie and my wife Marge would talk for another hour. They'd wake me up, say goodbye, and so forth. At the end of six of those sessions, 
the two of them said, we have talked about this now for six weeks, and we have come up with no reason why you shouldn't give insurance a try. Well, I, at that point I was sort of desperate because I needed to get out of what I was doing. So as much as Mars' decision as was your decision, it sounds like, That's from right. what, I, what I gather. They, in, they, they interviewed her more than you. Yeah. Her and the, <laughs> the insurance for me. Well, there you go. And the deal was I tried it for three years and uh, 45 years later I called Bernie and said, Bernie, I've just completed the 15th three-year trial <laughs> and decided I'm not going to stay in the insurance business and he laughed and that was when I retired in 2003, wow. exactly 30, uh, 45 years from the day I started. Hmm. Now as far as NAEPC is concerned, that was sort of interesting also because Fred Roselle, who's been mentioned, came out to Colorado and he was looking for people who had been through the chairs that might that knew what, how an estate planning council worked that might come on the national board. And so uh, I, was, I had just finished being president of the Denver Estate Planning Council. He said, you ought to come. Invited me to come to Portland, Oregon in 1968. Right. Mm -hmm. I uh, went to Portland. Now to tell you how desperate they were, um, I just went as an observer, as it were, or I guess I was a representative of the Denver Council. An attendee. And uh, by the time that meeting was over, I w was on, on the board. Mm -hmm. There wasn't any nominating committee or anything else. They, they just saw, saw an opportunity and plucked me out and away I went. It's the role 80% of the time, it's showing up makes the difference 80% yeah. of the time. Yep. Now, Part of what got me there was that after listening to a, a day of their meetings and deliberations, that what we really needed was some PR, public relations, because the people in the profession didn't know about the estate planning council movement, and the de general public knew even less. They didn't even know what estate planning was. Right. Yeah. So I had two different areas that I said we need the organization needs to work on. And they turned to me and they said, you're it. I became PR chairman, <laughs> whether I wanted to or not. That was my first position in NAEPC. So, okay. And so we prepared a newsletter to go to the councils. We didn't have any money to send it out. And of course, in those days, snail mail was expensive, nowhere near as expensive as it is now. But it was expensive, so we couldn't afford that, first. Second of all, we didn't have the names and addresses of all the people because there wasn't any national registration. There wasn't a national office that had all of that. We couldn't afford to do that anyway, so that the Denver Council, we would send out 250 of those newsletters and say, please send these out with the next announcement of your annual or next meeting. That didn't work because I started calling people in the various councils that I knew about. Mm -hmm. Did you see the newsletter? What newsletter? Oh, no. The answer was that nobody was taking the time to fold them and put them in the notice. It took work. Oh, yeah. So it's going yeah. nowhere. So that was a dead end. Well, then the other side of it was the general public and how do you get to the general public? And I had a very close friend, client, who was uh, head of a local advertising firm in, in De Denver. And he said, well, hard is going to cost a lot of money to do the kind of advertising you're talking about so that everybody knows who you are. And I said, well, Terry, Terry Barnhart was his name. I said, Terry, I keep hearing these public service announcements that people, and I'm told that they, the stations have to run these from time to time. What about that? Well, you know, that didn't get them much money, but uh, he agreed to talk about it and put one of his guys working with me. And so we did that. And everybody laughed. They said, you know, those are going to be run between 12 a.m. and 5 a.m. when nobody's going to hear them. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll see what happens. And what happened was that within two weeks after those hit the 
the uh, radio stations mm -hmm. and the television stations, both groups were calling, saying, how do we find one of those estate planners you talked about? Oh, wow. Well, how do you find one? Mm -hmm. We went to the council. The council said, we can't recommend somebody because if we recommend one guy, then all the rest of them are going to be out of joint because they didn't get them. Right. right. First, and secondly, there's no way that we know whether somebody is good. Now, obviously, the guys who've been in it for 50 years or 30 years um, and have a local reputation, we know they're good, mm -hmm. but they don't want to spend the time with somebody brand new who's no. looking for somebody to talk to. So we were suddenly at a point where we couldn't recommend somebody to fulfill the requests that were coming in from the advertising that was very effective. Mm -hmm. So at the next national board meeting where I happened to be president, mm -hmm. and the uh, president isn't supposed to make motions, but I excused myself for a minute and made a proposal that we needed a designation in estate planning that would tell people that this person was an acceptable person to work with and qualified. Mm -hmm. And that to do that, we should have an exam that would have two parts to it. One would be 50 questions that had to do with general estate planning that anybody in any of the four disciplines sure. would know about. The second one would be specific to their particular uh, area of operation. So if it were an attorney, it would be 50 questions of the law side right. in addition to the 50 questions of general. Mm -hmm. That was my proposal. And I was defeated unanimously. Mm -hmm. The board wow. didn't want anything to do with another designation. In 1976, there were probably a tenth as many designations as there are today. And they were saying there were too many. Mm -hmm. So that true. tells you where we are today. Yeah. Who were the people who were involved with you to get it off the ground so that it was accepted by the board? Well, um, Henry Gissel, who followed me, mm -hmm. was an attorney from um, Houston, Texas, and he was very prominent in ACTEC, and uh, so he he helped uh, get people thinking along that line. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems that I didn't touch on before, but it has to come in at this point, is that I had to find some way of funding for those pu the public service spots, mm -hmm. and to do that, I was aided by Burl Abin and Tom Austin, who were members of the big eight um, accounting firms okay. that said that they would get their accounting firms to come up with $1,000 a year to be a patron member to fund that. Okay. And then I talked to insurance companies. Actually, we had more than the two, actually Price Waterhouse. So I had three accounting firms, and then I went to the various different insurance companies and said, look, this is going to be good PR for uh, you people and for your insurance company, and can you come up with $1,000? So we managed to get 25 or 30 patrons, and actually for the 15 years of gestation of the AEP, or Credit Estate Planner designation, though that nominally $30,000 kept the organization alive and enabled us to get that put together. Mm. Now, each of the various different presidents in that 15-year period contributed to the program. Mm -hmm. The last five years, six years, after we finally determined that we were going to do this and we had an outfit in, in Texas that was going to run the exam for mm -hmm. us, uh, we needed the questions. And so these guys came up with 300 questions each in their particular uh, discipline. And those were the questions that were used. And then this 
outfit in Texas put them into a rotating bin and they came up with a set of questions that would be given to each mm -hmm. individual. Okay. And uh, that's what we used. And in 1991, we finally got the exam put together and got it taken. And I had made a point to not be one to come up with the questions. First of all, I didn't have time to write them all out. But more importantly, I wanted to take the exam to make sure that I was comfortable with the way it looked. And so I took that first exam and managed to pass it. And I think there were 30 of us that were in that first class. The, uh, I didn't get numbers, certificate number one, I should have because my name starts with an A, but the five presidents that wrote the questions they were, they couldn't take the exam because they'd written the questions. So we made them uh, per se uh, AEPs, and so they were the first five people sure. to get the certificate, right. and I got number six. <laughs> anyway, um, after that, as you know, nothing is smooth. After that, one of the guys who took it from Denver, who was a close friend of mine, and was t talking about teaching about estate planning all over the country didn't pass. Mm -hmm. Now that was became a major problem because for that reason, most of the seasoned people that we wanted to have be AEPs wouldn't take the exam because they were afraid they might not pass it. So, right. yeah, sure. And so that led to our setting up a grandfathering program for people who had been in the practice for 15 years Mm -hmm. that wouldn't have to take an exam. Sure. Right. And that has been very important to the whole thing. What happened with that one guy, however, I needed to know what the questions were. Well, the people in Texas weren't about to let somebody see those questions. No. Yeah. And it, it took a year and a half to get the questions. And the minute I got them, I knew what the problem was because some of the questions had been written with a fact situation and then a question and a question and a question. And when they had put them in the computer, they had only had, they hadn't had both pieces with the question. So the question didn't make any sense. No, and when yeah, we, relevant to the story. That's right, when we took those out, why well, this guy passed beautifully. But that's yeah. the kind of thing you go through in developing something like right. this. Right. And uh, so that's that's how it came to be, and it took 15 years of gestation from 76 to 91 before we had the first class. And then we had a problem because it was not AEP initially. Oh. It was CEP, right. Certified oh, Estate Planner. Yeah. Yeah. And the Certified Financial Planners, who were headquartered in Denver, hired one of the firms that were good friends of mine and said, we're going to sue you because that's work. infringement yeah. on our copyright sure. and that would be confusing to the public. So that threw us into a tizzy. Well, we started figuring out what else could we call it. And then we came up with accredited estate planner and that was a stroke of genius. Those people did us a whale of a favor by making us change. Why? Because accredited estate planner is at the top of the list because it starts with A. You see, yeah. if we'd been certified estate planner, we'd have What's been down that? in the pack yeah. oh, and it wouldn't have been anywhere near as prominent. We're the number one because mm -hmm. AEP starts with an A. Mm -hmm. So interesting the way things like that right. work out. Right. Yeah. But and that's the history of how it's got started. And that's fascinating because we have councils now that get upset about asking for sponsorships. So to know that it started with the AEP to get different firms to sponsor an accreditation mm -hmm. process is really great. Tell us some of the stories about how these different designations got added and why it's important to have all the different designations represented. Both. Both. Obviously, the whole concept of estate planning councils mm -hmm. 
is the idea of getting to know the people you're going to work with. And that goes back to the history. In the, before I came, right about the time I was coming, there were still very real conflicts between the lawyers and the accountants and the insurance people. Mm -hmm. And there were all sorts of cases in which the insurance people put together a program and then it went to the attorney and the attorney said, oh, no, no, that's the wrong kind of insurance. You should have it this kind of this company and so forth. And the same thing was being done by the accountants. Mm -hmm. And the insurance people didn't want to come anywhere close to those people because they would, knew that they were likely to get shot down right. by the attorney or the accountant. And so they had real turf wars going. Well, some people in the 30s, actually, maybe the late 20s, we don't know for sure, but we know the Boston Estate Planning Council dates back to 1930, and that they recognized the importance of getting people together because you don't badmouth somebody who's a friend. Mm -hmm. And so if we could get all of the estate planners together in all four disciplines in those days, together in one group and get to know each other, then it was easy to work together because they knew each other. Sure. And that was the goal. And unfortunately, I got shot down with that one in Denver because we, Denver had a limit as to how many could be in the council. Right. And uh, it was being exceeded. Mm. We had a waiting list of 35 people. Wow. And by the time I got the Denver council, to agree to set up an emeritus status for the people who'd been in it for 15 years, so free up some spaces for the new guys. The new guys said, shucks, we'd much rather be the founding members of a new council sure. rather than being part of the Denver council. The old, the old council. And that's how Rocky Mountain Estate Planning <laughs> Council really happened. Yeah. And now we've got, and the other thing was that some of the councils met for breakfast, others meant for lunch, and others meant for dinner. And so you had people who didn't like to go to some of those, and so the, we had ended up with nine different councils in Colorado, and most of those are geographic differences, because people aren't going to go from Denver to Grand Junction. Right. And how many oh. councils did you help found in Colorado, Hart? Well, actually, probably five. Five, okay. Um, and that's not really accurate to say help found because I didn't want them because I wanted everybody in one council. But I was, you know, these people said, we want to start a council. How do we do it? And I, you're going to start a council. I want to have as many councils as possible. But Boulder didn't want to come to Denver. Sure. So Boulder was the first one. And... Um, then we had a southeast Denver because they didn't want to come into right. town. Sure. We had a, a Centennial, which is on the west side of Denver, and they didn't want to come into town. And, and Rocky Mountain had dinner meetings for the people who wanted dinner meeting, didn't want to get up for breakfast. Mm -hmm. And so you had all of these various different... Uh, and then the final division, you'll get a kick out of this, is the Women's Estate Planning Council. Now think uh -huh. about that for a minute. If we set up a, a Men's Estate Planning Council that nobody would have anything to do with it, it would be absolutely terrible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's all right to have a Women's Estate Planning Council and it's a great council. Yeah. They do a great job and they have a great group of gals. Yeah. And they have one, <laughs> one outsider member. One token male? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm their token male, <laughs> and, and that was totally accidental. I went to a meeting because as, as supervisor of the various councils, I was supposed to do that. And the gal who was taking the money for the charge for that dinner mm -hmm. said, well, you know, you could do it very simply if you simply sign up with $175 for, yeah. for all of the, the year. And I said, well, that sounds like a good idea, so I did it. <laughs> And nobody ever has questioned it. I never was voted in, but I guess with money, I uh, became a member of that council, and I go to as many of those as I can, because they're fun. 
-hmm. But it's an interesting, different approach mm -hmm. because the gals have different concerns than the mm -hmm. fellas in many cases yeah. when it comes to estate planning. So that's how it it's a great story. all evolved. It's really great. I didn't know that. So how did the estate uh, law specialist de designation come about for well, attorneys? That came about because of specialization. Mm -hmm. um, the, the bar has been very reluctant to have specialization. Uh, the medical profession has specialization all over the place, and they don't seem to worry about the qualifications, I guess because going through law, uh, medical school and having a medical uh, residency in a specialty uh, takes care of the question of the, who is and who isn't the specialist. Mm -hmm. But the law was not able to do that. There were some states where the state had a specialization yeah. program. California. I think Florida was, Florida was one, I can't remember who all else. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was great. But most of the states, or many of the states, didn't want to have specialization. Uh, they didn't want it in their state planning because they were afraid if they had it in the state planning, it would bloom into other, all of the other areas of the law, and they didn't want to get into all that specialization. Sure. And so we had many states that said, we don't want any part of it. And uh, we knew there were people out there that were attorneys. And so we talked to the American Bar Association and they hemmed and hawed. They didn't really want to do that. They, they said, well, you know, it's coming, but uh, they, they were slow. But we finally put it together. Harold Apolinsky from uh, Alabama was uh, very prominent in that world. And he and Henry Gissel and some others uh, worked on the Bar Association. And, but the other th problem was that they didn't want an organization that wasn't all attorneys running the program. And so NAEPC could not be the sponsor because it had to be all attorneys. Sure. And so they, we created the state law specialists and that was all the people on the board who were attorneys. Mm -hmm. And I qualified for that because I was an attorney, even though I was primarily working on the insurance side rather than the law side. Sure. Right. And uh, so that being the case, then we had to put together an exam and get it approved by the Bar Association. But we did that and uh, it ha hasn't gone in wildfire, but the, the people who have gotten that designation are very proud of it, yeah. and there yeah. it, it's growing, but, but not mm -hmm. by leaps and bounds. But yeah. that, that's how it got started and why it got started, and um, I hope it progresses. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, in the states that already have specialization, why they aren't about to have our specialization or specialization from the EPLS where they can have it from their local bar. Right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we aren't going to get what would probably be the most fruitful area of new recruits because uh, they're the states that already have specialization and right. it's only the ones that don't have it that are interested in the EPLS. But uh, that was, that's how it got started and why. Mm. And uh, we owe uh, Harold Apolinsky and there was one other fellow that was very involved in it. And, um, his name is escaping me right at the moment, but uh, that's mm -hmm. the answer to that question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you've been involved with NAPAC for 50 years. I know all of us have been involved with the organizations, um, but 50 years is a long time. So why have you stuck with NAPAC that long? And not just as a member, but as a real leader of the organization. Well, as you said earlier, one of the things in life is failure. And uh, while, while the AEP was not failure, it was success, mm -hmm. the total goal 
the reason for AEP was to get people to know what accredited estate planning, what estate planning was all about and why they should have it. And I haven't done that. Oh, okay. I don't have everybody in America thinking about estate planning. In fact, the numbers that just came out, or what, what was it, 71% people don't have yeah. wills? Yep. Well, that, that, that means that I failed in the job not done, Mark. program of getting the, the rest of them yep. into having a will. And of course, uh, <laughs> the truism is that we, you have a will, but it's the will that the federal government gives you. Yeah. And is, it, is the money going where you want it to go? Right. And uh, we haven't done as much as we need to do, and that's why I'm very much in favor of the new PR program that we're putting out together. Uh, yeah. And I keep looking at myself and saying, well, should we go back to ground zero and make some public service there announcements? Uh -huh. uh, because they're, they're there and people yeah. hear them, yeah. and uh, there are lots of different avenues that you can follow in a state in uh, public relations yes. and so uh, it'd be interesting to see what happens in the next 10 years but uh, that's why I figure that uh, you guys are going to have to put up with me till they carry yeah. me okay. out because uh, I haven't gotten all of this accomplished. I'm glad your job's not done yet Hart. Yeah. Uh, you got something to still to work on. So that's why I'm still No that's still really great. That's a fair answer. So who are some of the key people that you've gotten to know over 50 years. I've found in my experience with the local estate planning councils and then the honor of being on the board, it is a remarkable group of people. Oh, yeah. And so who are some of the key people that you've met and gotten to know over the last 50 years? Well, I guess I'd have to go back as far as people that, are, that were important to it, would be the people that got me in, involved in the first place. Professor Howard Hall, University of Wisconsin, uh, conducted the first trust course that I took. Mm -hmm. And I was fascinated. I had no idea, you know, I knew from legal history that there were, the trusts had started in England and were very important and of course were primarily spendthrift trusts to keep mm -hmm. um, people from dissipating their estate for the detriment of the rest of the <laughs> people in the, in the estate. Uh, but he taught me all the different types of trusts and that was in 1952 uh, when I was senior in undergraduate and went into law mm -hmm. uh, for my senior year because I had enough credits that I could do that, hoping to do that and stay out of uh, Korea uh, it didn't work because the our asked the military to let me wait until I finished my, uh, uh, my law degree and they wrote back and said we really don't need more attorneys in Korea thank you very much you will report as an MP officer <laughs> and so away I went but uh, Professor Hall was important and Dick Eflin who was the head of the state planning uh, department of the law school at the University of Wisconsin and he put on seminars on estate planning and that's what really got me interested and uh, both he and Howard Hall suggested that I get into this will drafting contest and uh, I got into that mm -hmm. and I managed to win that mm -hmm. and uh, what kind of attorney was your father my father was primarily a public utilities uh, oh. with estate planning he, he did some, but not, no, not he, he didn't, but not okay. primarily. He uh, represented uh, Wisconsin uh, Power and Light Company, uh, the uh, okay. uh, various different utilities in Wisconsin, was a member of the t utility section of the American Bar Association for many years, mm -hmm. and also was general counsel for uh, Railback Battery Company. Mm -hmm. And uh, he went all over the country solving their problems with labor unions during the war years and then after the war. Mm -hmm. And so that was where I got interested in the, in the um, um, 
labor relations part, and those were my two areas of, okay. of concern mm -hmm. and of interest and study. And then, uh, well, since then, actually, uh, probably 50% of the members of the Estate Planning Council Hall of Fame are that are attorneys are guys who taught, talked, and taught estate planning from the podium of right. various different meetings, right. yeah. and um, they've become very good friends over the years. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the list would be uh, as long as your arm of the ones that well longer than mine, but friends yeah. and helpers and mm -hmm. so forth. But uh, it's it's a, a great bunch of people, and uh, they yeah. they've been leaders in NABC for quite a number of years. And as passionate about NAPIC and estate planning as you are too, I think in many ways. I mean, they're very passionate about this profession for sure. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting profession and uh, the people who are involved in it are very interesting people and you have to be because one of the things that is critical to estate planning is getting to know the client. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was interesting to me because in the early years or middle years actually of my insurance experience everybody was saying oh don't go out and see them. Have them come into your office. And I said, no. That's the wrong way to do it. Because when you go out to their homes, you find out about what their interests are mm -hmm. and about what they really need to do with their estate planning, what they need to be considering and how. Whereas if you're in the office, you fill out a questionnaire but the questionnaire only has the answers to those questions. And you don't get into the depth that you need to be in in order to really understand somebody's estate and their needs. And uh, that's what estate planning is all about. And that's one of, I think, the beauties of the team concept. Mm -hmm. Because you have at least four people looking at an estate and feeding in information. And you'll have an accountant over here who knows about an investment somebody took out that nobody else in the family knows about, yeah. much less any of the other advisor. Mm -hmm. But he can put that in and get it into the mix. Right. And um, you know, I, I characterize estate planning as a great big jigsaw puzzle. And you've got to have all the pieces yeah. in order to really make it work for a client. And a picture yeah. too. And an awful lot of those things are get mm -hmm. dumped on the floor or something behind the, the refrigerator or it somewhere. Forever. Yeah. So they don't get into the into the picture. Yeah. And then yeah. suddenly, Bill Cantwell, who was a, a, an associate of mine in Holland and Hart, and was one of my mentors in estate planning in the mm -hmm. Colorado scene. Um, used to tell the story of having driven across Wyoming, actually Montana, mm -hmm. and he came into this filling station where he had to have some work done. And so he was sitting in the lobby of the, or the, the office of this place, and he got to looking around. And my golly, there were a whole bunch of pictures on the wall. And he looked at them a little bit more closely. And uh, he said to the guy, where did you get these pictures? Are they originals or are they prints? He said, oh, they're originals. He said, the guy by the name of Russell lived down the road from me and whenever he had a problem, he'd come in and I'd take care of it. And he never had enough money, so he'd give me a picture. <laughs> that guy had 50 Charlie Russell, Charlie Russell. original oh, wow. paintings. And he had no idea he had an estate well, he had an estate of millions, literally. Hanging, yeah. in the, hanging in the office. Didn't know he had it. Mm. And, he, and, and, and his estate planner didn't know he had it because he'd never looked at him. Mm. Yeah. So you see, you got to be there and look at them mm -hmm. and find out what people's interests are. The mm -hmm. other place you find out is what charities they're interested in. Do they right. support the symphony? Do they support the opera, the ballet? Right. Because those become important. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. in the state planning, critically important to today's world because that's funding most of the, of the artistic community is funded by charitable contributions. Sure. And that's why we brought the charitable people mm -hmm. into the ranks of the state planning. Yep. And critically important. Mm -hmm. They are, they are. So we're about to start the 55th annual conference. You've got over 60 years experience in estate planning. What do you see as the challenges or opportunities for the field as a whole? Well, uh, obviously the, the number one is PR. Uh, as we've talked before because we haven't got the message out to people. And we got to paint the pictures of why it's important. Take the, the various, there's a couple of books out the insurance world has put out of estates of prominent people mm -hmm. that were absolutely decimated because they didn't set them up right and there were art disputes among the family members or they set it up in such a manner that they paid, paid tremendous amounts of tax and stuff like that. Right. That we got to get that message out so that people understand the need, the critical need for estate planning. But there's some other areas. One of them that I'm particularly concerned about right at the present time mm -hmm. is what I consider the epidemic of juvenile and young adult suicides mm -hmm. and it's become obvious to me that back in the 60s, 50s, 40s they came out, the sociologists came out with the idea that you couldn't criticize people because if you did that you would warp their psyche yeah. and that you had to do everything in terms of positives of how, how good they were. That's a mistake. Because life is not that way. People are going to fail. And the important thing in life is picking themselves up and starting over again. Yeah. True. And if you look at the people that are famous and that are wealthy and successful, you'll find almost all of them had some negative that they had to pick themselves up and start over again and keep going. And we're not teaching that. The families don't understand it because most of the families are of an age where they didn't understand that, so they can't teach their kids right. what that's all about. It yeah. does. So you have lots of life experience, lots of professional experience. Um, one of the things that we've noticed um, in the industry is that as professionals, we tend to be on the aging end older. And what, if you had something you could say to a young professional starting out in estate planning, what would you tell them? Well, I, I would tell them that they're in a unique position where they can help their clients as very few people that they're going to meet can help them. Because most people don't think about estate planning. And if they do, it's <laughs> near, very near the end, whereas you need to be doing it all the way through life. Because among other things, you never know when the end is going to come. And it might come tomorrow. And I remember vividly in high school having a friend suddenly drop dead, and I ended up singing at his funeral. And he was the same age I was. And you know that, that that you never know, and you have to be ready, and that means that the estate planning has to be early on, rather than later on. And actually, people don't think of it as estate planning, but when you take out insurance, you have to name a beneficiary, right. and that's estate planning. And how it's done can be very very important, and. Uh, so you, you need, I tell people, they need to meet that challenge in life and uh, think in terms not just of today and tomorrow, but 
or what the way things are today and tomorrow, what the way things might change tomorrow or sometime out in the future, and you're talking a widespread of time, and uh, the plan has to have enough flexibility to handle those various different times in one's life. Thank you. Is there anything you want to share with us that we haven't covered yet? <laughs> <laughs> well, as my family would tell me, that's the worst, worst possible comment you could make because I can <laughs> tell, tell stories for, forever. And um, I've been very fortunate because I've been in a lot of different places and a lot of different times and under a lot of different circumstances. And uh, I guess the, the bottom line is that uh, we never know what's going to happen tomorrow. And uh, we need to be open and receptive to what happens tomorrow and make the most of it. And uh, probably the most critical part of that is to not let yourself be mired down in the negatives and to realize that uh, there are all sorts of possibilities of positives in the future and to be ready to take advantage of them. And that gets back to my concern about the um, mortality of, of young people mm -hmm. today. Well, Hart, we are um, truly humbled to be having spent this time with you today. Well, I'm, I'm humbled that you're interested in what I have to say. You know, to, to, to listen in on a life story and a journey such as yours is a rare experience for the people in this room and for those that might be watching this video in the future. And I think living a full life, and I hope you still have many more years to come to continue to fill your full life with more adventures and, and experiences that will still continue to ex expand your life and expand those that get to enjoy the time with you and in, in the time to come. I know we as a NAPIC community feel very strongly that we hope you'll continue to be a part of our organization for years to come because we value your insight, your experience, your knowledge, your passion for things like you've described this afternoon, you know, from, you know, from the respect for the law, for listening to our clients, to being in their homes, to knowing those stories and to sharing your passion for those that find themselves at, at, at a point where they might take their own life. And those are very critical things for us to hear from you and your wisdom that you bring to us today. Um, we've learned a lot and you have truly touched the lives of so many of us over the years and truly the life of NAPIC. I mean, I don't think any of us would be here today as a NAPIC mm -hmm. community if it wasn't for the hard work and, and passion and, and you know, just uh, desire to have uh, NAPIC be what it is today. So again, we're humbled to be in New York, be with you today. Uh, congratulations on receiving two of NAPIC's highest honors uh, here this week. You know, you are truly deserving of being listed in the NAPIC Estate Planning Hall of Fame and receiving the Distinguished Accredited Estate Planner designation. Uh, those are high, high marks for us to give you at this 50th anniversary of your time with NAPIC. And again, we're so honored to be a part of that experience together. And I'll just say on behalf of the 275 estate planning councils, over 2,000 accredited estate planners, and all of those that are a part of the NAPIC community across this country. Uh, we are thankful for your service, and we are so grateful for who you are, Hart. Thank you for this time today. Well, thank you. My pleasure. Great.